Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not did you find that? I think it's tough. But we need to No one's coming in right after this. We're not going to do that. That's funny though. What is the one that you're just going to like? So, yeah, that's I think so, yes. And then she also oh, ordered it like not Three, 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 three
I always thought like we were looking for emergencies. I only thought that, and that's not like the one that turned to the very And then you see frogs. Yeah, it's like frogs. Oh, that's right. Her eyes is good. Don't talk about the frogs. yeah, he doesn't know what he doesn't know. We go probably something for the four times, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that was the first time. It's not online, it's not on Zoom, so you don't know that. <laughs> Is there anybody named Dakota? Yeah, I would put it. Say it's going to be Yeah, there is. in 2017, and he had multiple undergraduate research experiences, many which included reptiles, so it's a little bit surprising that he ended up doing postal ecology, um, and then as his post sort of got a laureate experience, he did a bunch of sort of temporary field work positions where he gained a lot of really good field skills, um, some of which I think will be showcased today in his talk. Um, John arrived at OSU in the fall of 2018 with the original goal of getting a PhD and teaching at a small liberal arts college or community college. Even though John's aspirations ultimately changed, he, accompl he accomplished many things here at OSU, including getting a G-cut certification and being a really active member in the grad study team. John arrived um, when John arrived, he, he, was, he was pretty um, open to different kinds of projects, and he, would, he knew he was interested in coastal ecosystems and how they mitigate carbon emissions, and he knew he liked field work, and I think secretly he knew that he also liked to serve. <laughs> so all of that kind of led him to doing systems. And John really arrived at an auspicious time for my lab. We were starting to wade into biogeochemistry of dunes, and Katya Jay, who is a postdoc now at the uh, University of uh, Colorado Boulder, um, had the brilliant idea to measure carbon in dunes. And so she and John kind of started exploring this and looking in the literature and realizing that actually there were very few studies on carbon sequestration. Um, and so she and John sort of teamed up and came up with a methodology to measure carbon and ways of extracting carbon from dune, which is not as straightforward as you might think. Um, Katya ultimately ended up studying uh, the dunes in North Carolina and John the dunes of the Pacific Northwest. So long story short, they were both very successful in using funds that um, Peter and Peter Ruggiero and I obtained from NOAA and also an NSF graduate fellowship that John received. Uh, 
we they have um, made the first, and I think probably the best complete measurements of carbon in dunes um, in the world. And John really embraced the rigors of human field work. He extracted hundreds of panels of sand from over 350 kilometers of the Washington and Oregon coastline. That's a long way. And he spent many, many hours in the lab watching carbon being burned off that sand. Um, so, you know, he did these measurements in Andrew, Andrew Gerber's lab. And thank you, Andrew, for allowing us to do that. That was really an immense amount of work. And then, then John got to interpret his data, which was, um, you know, I think a considerable amount of work because no one really knows anything about carbon and dunes. And so John and Katja are sort of the experts in, in this field of study. They're very novel measurements. And John, I'm sure, has an exciting future beyond Corvallis and probably beyond dunes. Um, he's really interested in ecosystem restoration. And so rather than caring for sand, as he's doing here, <laughs> he's going to go on to more practical things of caring for very cute endangered species. Um, and um, I'm sure he'll do a brilliant job. And finally, I want to acknowledge what feels like kind of a milestone for my lab with John's defense today. John is the last of a large cohort of grad students that worked on Zoom, some of which are depicted here in Risa's wonderful mock-up um, and others that aren't here. Over the last handful of years, there were as many as seven grad students in my lab. That's a lot of research projects, as you might imagine. Uh, a lot of projects to help design, funding to obtain, letters to write, meetings to have, um, theses to review, and papers to shepherd through the publishing process. And so while I'm incredibly humbled by all the accomplishments of the grad students who passed through my lab and their amazing careers, I'm also ready for a break <laughs> and extremely happy for this day. Um, and stay tuned. I heard that the next community is going to be really good. <laughs> um, it's about these two enthusiastic and very wise grad students who carry on this tradition of doing research. And I've seen the trailer. I think it's going to be really good. So with that, John, tell us about your novel research and help us close out this chapter. Okay, hey, uh, everyone can hear me okay? Um, thank you, Sally, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to share with you the research I've been doing the past few years for my thesis on carbon storage in U.S. Pacific Northwest coastal dunes, the role of invasive beach grasses and sand supply. And I would like to start by thinking a little bit about all of the ecosystem services that coastal habitats provide, which include coastal protection from storms and erosion, a uh, really important habitat for a number of species, both commercially important species, recreational species, endangered species. These habitats provide income generation for shoreline communities, natural resources such as wood, fibers, sand for making glass. Um, they're really productive spaces for agriculture. They filter our water um, and reduce pollution. And they also link important processes and ecosystems from the terrestrial environment with the marine environment. And one ecosystem service that also habitats provide that's really important, particularly in the context of climate change, it isn't shown here, is the ability of these systems to sequester and store carbon. I'm going to use these terms sequestration and storage. Sequestration is a rate of carbon that comes into an ecosystem um, in a fixed period of time, whereas uh, carbon storage is static, just how much is there right now. And <clears throat> what this plot is showing is that salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrasses um, can sequester an order of magnitude more carbon um, per year than terrestrial forests, which is really incredible and, again, is important in the kinds of climate change, which is too much carbon in the atmosphere, contributing to 
uh, the intensity and increasing frequency of natural disasters and large weather events that are very disruptive. And the reason that coastal ecosystems are so good at storing carbon is they actually have not one but two mechanisms to do it. So terrestrial ecosystems such as this grassland on the left and coastal ecosystems like the salt marsh on the right um, can both store carbon through primary production of the vegetation, where as the plants are growing, they're actually not pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis, storing it in their tissues, pumping in below ground. But coastal ecosystems can also import marine carbon um, because many of these systems uh, accumulate sediment at a rate of several millimeters per year that's been deposited through wind or water. And um, that might not sound like a lot, but if you ever take 50% of that sediment is carbon-rich organic matter, that can accumulate um, and contribute significantly to the carbon stocks in coastal ecosystems. Um, what's also unique about coastal systems is that they are wet. Um, salt marshes, eelgrass beds, and mangroves are uh, often submerged during high tides or completely submerged in some cases. And having all that water um, on top of the sediment um, really reduces the amount of aerobic respiration and reduces the decomposition of organic matter that's there. So it's getting more organic matter that often has longer residence. Now, coastal dunes provide a number of important ecosystem services like coastal protection. Uh, recreation and conservation habitat for the adorable uh, western snowy plover, which is endangered. Um, but the ability for coastal dunes to store carbon has been relatively understudied, as so I mentioned in the intro. Um, despite that dunes have both these mechanisms for carbon storage that I've just sort of walked through, through the primary production of the vegetation and the accumulation of marine sediment. And so this figure is showing what that biophysical feedback loop looks like, where the process of dune formation is sort of dependent on these two things. The vegetation is growing and storing carbon as it grows and spreads roots and rhizomes underground, but it's also capturing sediment that gets blown up from the beach. And any carbon that's on that sediment is building up a dune in the process of, um, of dune formation. So we have both of these mechanisms for carbon storage, um, but it's been relatively understudied, particularly um, when we think sort of at a global scale. So um, while salt, marsh, salt marshes, mangroves, and eelgrasses um, collectively only make up around 6% of the world's coastlines, um, coastal dunes make up 30% of the world's ice cream coastline. And this uh, figure is showing the percentage of each continent's coastline that's made of sandy substrate versus rocky outcroppings or cliffs. So you can see this is an extremely prevalent system worldwide. Um, and I've added these green stars to show uh, the places where people have actually done studies of dune carbon storage. Um, so there's two on the east coast of the US, four in Europe, and two in Australia, but the two in Australia of uh, very unique methodologies that make them difficult to compare to any of the other systems. And so we really have a poor understanding globally of how much carbon dunes would store. And the Pacific Northwest is a great next place to look at dune carbon storage because dunes make up 45% of our coastline, and they have a really unique natural history here as well, um, such that prior to European colonization in the Northwest, uh, dunes would have looked something like this, where we had this really wide, uh, sort of low elevation dune system, where there was a lot of open sand that was flowing around and sort of shifting and forming uh, mounds around native vegetation, which would have included our native grass and the smallest, uh, along with other plants such as the silver beech weed or pink sand urbana, um, which this last one is, uh, um, we do have these plants still, but they occur in much lower abundances because in the early to mid 1900s, um, settlers began building infrastructure in the dune systems sort of right on the sand and quickly found out that uh, all this uh, bare sand was blowing around and burying these structures. It's a problem that continues to this day in some locations. And so uh, rather than relocate, they systematically planted two non-native species um, across the Northwest to try to stabilize that sand and prevent it from uh, blowing around and burying uh, houses and buildings. And those two uh, non-native species were in the arid area, which is native to Europe, Anemophila grubbling, which is native to the east coast of the United States. And uh, these two grasses are ecosystem engineers that have completely transformed the landscape of beaches and dunes in the Northwest. And they've actually also hybridized. Um, and my lab mate, Risa Asker, just ended a couple weeks ago, gave a really amazing talk about this sort of the spread and the abundance of this hybrid, and also the ecological implications, which I'll talk about today, include um, implications for carbon storage. So these two grasses. Uh, could impact carbon storage, again, through both of the mechanisms I talked about, um, through sort of the primary productivity, but also how much marine carbon they might be importing, because they actually build um, different sizes and shapes of dunes. So Mothla Aran area, the European beach grass, has really high vertical growth. It grows tall. Um, it has higher shoot density. 
It has um, relatively high standing obscurability and it tends to build dunes that are um, relatively tall and steep and narrow. Whereas Amapla brevilligulata, the grass native of the east coast of the US, um, tends to grow more laterally as opposed to vertically. It has moderate shoot density. Um, it doesn't capture quite as much sand and it tends to build dunes that are a little bit shorter but wider in the cross shore direction. And for those of you who are not familiar with four dune terminology, I'm writing these figures and um, I'm going to use the, the term four dune a lot. And the four dune is actually the dune ridge that's closest to the waterline. Um, and it consists of the toe, crest, and heel, where the crest is sort of the highest point closest to the shoreline. MHW is the mean high water line and shoreline. And there's also this back point here. And that refers to sort of the transition between um, grassy vegetation and a coastal forest or housing developments or sort of whatever occurs landward of the grassy dune system. Um, so I'll continue to use those terminologies across this profile. And uh, for those of you who are maybe more visual learners and it's hard to remember toe, crest, heel, you can think of most toe, crest, heel, and back. Uh, this last <laughs> image is actually a scan of my own back after all the field work. <laughs> um, so these two grasses have, again, completely transformed the new landscape in Oregon and Washington. So instead of having uh, this open systems of sand, the high diversity of native flora, we have, um, in most places, this uh, very large continuous ridge of four dune with um, really only a handful of the species it used to have and mostly dominated by one or both of the Amapla grasses. Um, there are a few exceptions though, um, where there are habitat restoration areas or HRAs, such as this one in New Haven Bay, Oregon. And these are areas where various agencies have tried to restore sort of that open sand habitat to improve nesting conditions for uh, shorebirds such as the endangered western swimming plover. And so in these areas, they've gone out with bulldozers and graded the dune to a lower elevation. And they've also um, removed the herbicide or sort of mechanical pulling and try to remove as much of the amapla grass as they can. And so while this doesn't really resemble the same diverse flourishing ecosystem we had 100 years ago, it does provide a, a little bit of a setup to compare carbon storage with and without uh, this invasive amapla grass. So with all of that background, um, I set out to answer the following questions for my thesis. First, how much carbon is stored in the Pacific Northwest coastal dunes, and how do they compare to other coastal dunes and ecosystems globally? Second, does carbon storage vary by depth, foreign profile location, which is again toe, crest, heel, and back, by carbon stock type, um, which is above ground grass biomass, below ground grass biomass, and sand? I've kind of used this color coding and little symbols to help you keep track of which stock type I'm talking about because it's going to come up a lot. Um, how does carbon storage vary by site or dominant grass species? Third, what geomorphological and ecological factors explain the variability in carbon storage of coastal dunes? And then finally, how do these um, habitat estuarian areas impact carbon storage relative to the amount of ever dunes? So um, to answer these four questions, uh, I went out to 14 sites in Oregon and Washington uh, over the course of three years, 2020 to 2022. And 11 of these sites are um, sort of amophila sites where the Amophilo grass is very dominant, it's taken over. Um, and three of the sites are habitat restoration areas. And those three restoration areas are paired adjacent to reference Amophilo sites. So all things considered, the main difference shouldn't be any big site differences, just the Amophilo, the, um, the restoration treatment. Um, so at each of these sites, we set up three to six cross shore transects. And a transect is essentially a long measuring tape that goes from the waterline across the beach, up and over the dune, until we hit coastal forest or uh, housing development. And uh, along that transect, we surveyed the dune elevation profile using this real-time kinematic GPS backpack, which is this yellow backpack with kind of a Teletubby antenna. And uh, as you can see here, uh, these dunes vary quite a bit in terms of their size and shape. Some of them, like this one on the left, are very wide and flat dunes, whereas some, like this one at Sand Lake, Oregon, are extremely tall and steep. And what we do with the elevation data is we can actually plot it to see what the dune profile looks like, where we're sort of at the ocean on the left, and this diagram up here is kind of showing a more conceptual model. And as we move to the right, we're moving landward across the beach over the four dune toe, crest, heel, and back until we hit again a different type of vegetation or uh, structures. And from these profiles, we get a lot of useful information that might tell us a little bit about the variation in carbon storage. Um, and those um, those morphometrics, those dune morphometrics, as we call them, um, include things like the beach width and beach slope. Um, it includes the forging width and forging height, 
Uh, the total width of sort of this grassy dune area, how wide is this grassy dune system? Um, and we also get things like the volume of sediment. If we want to know how much carbon is in dunes, we need to know how much dune is there. And so um, in red, I've sort of broken up uh, this, this four dune profile um, into zones. So the toe zone, crest zone, heel and back. And so rather than just having a singular point at the toe, um, we sort of look at similarities in the vegetation across the profile and said, okay, where the vegetation is most similar around the point toe, we'll call that the toe zone, where it's similar around the point crest, we'll call that the crest zone, et cetera. And we're able to calculate the dune volume within each of these regions, sort of know how carbon density changes across the profile. We also um, collected shoreline change rates for all these transects and sediment deposition rate. Um, so each of these transects are locations where previous uh, lab mates in the hacker lab have gone and surveyed the dune uh, morphology and the vegetation all the way back to 2012. And so, as you can see here, we sort of have a time lapse where red is 2012 and kind of following the colors of the rainbow. So, we get to blue is most recent. You can see um, these black dots are the toe, crest, hip, and back. Um, we can actually measure at very specific points um, how much deposition or erosion has occurred at that location and be able to try to figure out how that might impact carbon storage. The second uh, thing we did at these uh, transects was conducting stir uh, vegetation surveys. So every five meters along the transect, we put down a quarter meter square quadrat and counted uh, the density of all the species that occurred there. And then at the toe, crest, heel, and back, we also collected three of each of the dominant grass species, brought them back to the lab, and we measured the mean biomass per shoot and the carbon content of each species. So with all of that data combined, we're able to estimate what is the total amount of carbon at each site in the above ground biomass? How does it break up by the species that occur there? And how does that change as we move across the dune profile and from the toe to the back? Finally, to measure the amount of carbon below ground, um, we uh, used meter deep sediment cores um, to collect sort of the roots, rhizomes, and sand, everything below ground. And as you can see here on the left, we just used a sledgehammer to pound these four inch diameter PVC tubes into the dune once they get a meter deep. We use this high lift jack to sort of attach it to the top of the core and just crank it out slowly. And um, most of the time this worked great and we have a meter of sand. Um, there were some occasions where the sand was either too loose or too dry and it would sort of just fall out the bottom of the tube and we didn't have any sample. So in those cases, we had to take the core again and try to dig it out um, and get to the bottom of the core, cap it and then pull it out. And it felt like we were sort of living the plot of one of my favorite childhood movie, Poles, um, where it was just like, okay, I guess this is how we collect cores now. And we ended up digging a lot of holes, and I was really fortunate to have a lot of help. Um, but by the end of the summer, we were certainly uh, very, very tired of that. <laughs> um, and so one way or another, we got these cores out and taken back to a campsite and passed them to this sediment extruder, which is a sort of custom designed um, contraption that mounts to the back of the pickup truck. And it's a several person job to have one person on the bottom using a scissor jack to push the sand out from the bottom, and one person on top collecting that sand in five centimeter intervals, and then someone collecting the sand in these Ziploc bags. So every five centimeters down to a meter deep, we know what's the carbon density in these cores at each profile location at each site, and gives us a good sense of the relationship between carbon and depth. Um, to give you a sense of what it looks like on the inside of these tubes, this is sort of uh, some, some practice cores or some ones we had to, to get rid of, um, where we actually just pulled out this plug of really dense roots and rhizomes. And rhizomes are the underground stems that grasses used to spread and grow. And so there's a lot of biomass here, and there's a lot of sand packed in there as well. Um, and so this is sort of what we're measuring. So we're trying to figure out how much organic carbon is stored because of these grasses. We also had some surprising things in these cores where we occasionally hit very driftwood that we couldn't see from the surface, and it would occasionally um, just thrash our core tubes and we'd have to make new ones. Um, but occasionally we were actually able to extrude these solid pucks of partially decayed driftwood. Um, I think the record was we had 25 straight centimeters of driftwood that went through our core. Um, and so this was a big surprise and definitely raised some interesting questions about how much driftwood could be contributing to um, the carbon budget in coastal dunes. And I'll talk about that again uh, later. So I take all these samples back to the lab, dry them, and then use a sieve to separate um, the sand from the below ground biomass, which is again sort of the roots and rhizomes from these grasses. And then um, I use element analysis to measure the amount of carbon in the below ground biomass. And for all the sand samples, I use a method called loss on ignition, where you basically um, 
put the sand in these tiny little teacups and combust it at really high temperatures. The difference in mass before and after is presumed to be organic matter that burned off in the process. Um, so it's a proxy for carbon. And in order to make sure um, we had a good relationship between organic matter measurements and carbon, um, we took a subset of those samples and also measured carbon through element analysis and created this regression where um, organic matter on the x-axis explained 91% of the variation in organic carbon measurements. So we felt really good about being able to convert um, our, our loss on emission measurements to carbon directly. Um, and now I'd like to share uh, my results and answer these four questions that I set out uh, to answer for my thesis. Um, you'll notice that in the top left here, I sort of highlighted which question I'm, I'm answering right away. And if you remember, the first question was just trying to figure out how much carbon is out here, how much is in dunes, and how does it compare to other ecosystems? And in order to answer that question of like, what's the carbon stock, um, I need to know the carbon density. So how much carbon per unit volume? And then how much sand is there? What's the volume of dune? to multiply those things together. And so I also have to answer a little bit of question teams. I have both of those highlighted right now, but really this is to get a question number one. And what this plot is showing is um, the, again, the forwarding profile. So I have the mean high, high water line, which is sort of the high tide mark, the mid beach, which is where the rack line is on the beach, um, and then tow crest heel and back. <clears throat> and that's what it's showing here along the x-axis, or sorry, along the top of the x-axis as well. And um, the wax is showing carbon density and the percent sand carbon. And what you can see is that um, actually at the beach, we have higher carbon density and it decreases towards the toe of the dune, at least within the top five centimeters. So I didn't take any fours at the beach, but I take scoops of sand in the top five centimeters. And again, at least at the surface, the carbon density decreases towards the toe and then increases again really dramatically as you move across the crest heel and back, presumably because of all the vegetation. There. And if we look at the relationship with depth at each profile location, so for instance, at the toe of the dune, um, zero, so zero centimeters, that's at the surface, all the way to 100 centimeters. Um, and I sort of loop some of the depth intervals together, combine them. Um, we can see that there's actually um, a, a really constant sand, dense, sand carbon density across the entire depth profile. Um, but if we look at the crest heel and back, uh, we see a really interesting pattern where regardless of how high the sand carbon density is at the surface, it sort of exponentially decreases with depth and reaches some sort of asymptotic value that's really similar to what we saw um, across the, the toe, where those values at the deepest parts of the core kind of always just level off similar values. And so not only now do we feel good about knowing the carbon density across the entire depth of the first meter, but we can start to make some assumptions about what's the carbon density deeper than one meter. Again, these dunes are very tall in some locations, much deeper than one meter. And if we want to estimate what's the carbon stock in the dune, um, we're making some assumptions about what the carbon density is below where we poured. Um, but we also saw a really similar pattern with the carbon density of the below ground biomass, where the roots and rhizomes also had kind of a similar exponential decrease and leveled off at the bottom of the course. So we know a little bit about carbon density. Um, now we're looking at dune volume, which is the second part of this equation. And to estimate dune volume, we use those um, GPS or backpack profiles that I showed you earlier. And this plot on the bottom is showing you the volume of sand per meter of coastline. So this is cubic meters of sand per meter of coastline if we're looking at sort of uh, uh, a cross section of the dune like this. And um, these bars are broken up in green and tan where the green portion is the volume within just the top meter of sediment. And so that's sort of the area between the, the surface of the dune, this brown line, and then this curved black line. So just in that top meter of dune, what's the volume of sand? And then the tan portion of these bars on the bottom is showing what's the volume of sand deeper than that, all the way down to the elevation of the toe. And so that's everything between this curved black line and between um, this dashed black line, which is again the elevation of the toe. So we have a really good estimate of carbon density in that top meter, some assumptions about the carbon density below, but this way we can sort of try to get some, some rough estimate of how much carbon is in these dunes total. And so um, this plot is now showing carbon stocks where the y-axis is the volume of carbon. Um, per meter of coastline. So again, it's looking sort of at a cross section of the dune per meter of coastline, the tons of carbon there. And it's organized by site where um, sort of north to south, left to right, Grand Harbor is in um, central Washington and Empire Dunes is in southern Oregon. And you can see there's quite a bit of variation between sites in carbon stock. Um, the differences were not statistically significant, but if we add them all together to see, um, you know, for how long each of these sites is, the amount of carbon there, um, we estimate over 50,000 tons of carbon 
at the sites we went to in Oregon, Washington, in the top meter of dunes. Um, and if we look at not just the top meter, but again, the entire volume of dunes with some assumptions about the carbon density, um, we see that um, there's actually, there actually is um, some significant differences between the sites uh, where Clatsop Plains has higher carbon stocks in the total volume of dunes compared to Pacific City, Oregon and Silk Coos, Oregon. And if we add all of these values together, um, we get over 200,000 tons of carbon um, in the total volume of dunes. And it's important to note that this is not even a comprehensive surveying of coastal dunes in Oregon, Washington. There are several places that have dunes that we didn't survey at all. Um, and this is also a really big number. So to try to provide some context for how much carbon is that, um, this 200,000 tons is uh, roughly equivalent to the annual emissions of 180,000 cars, uh, 15,000 average Americans, or 0 0.07 of a single billionaire. <laughs> um, and it's really hard to compare carbon stocks um, when it's sort of, you know, each ecosystem has a different geographical area. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be talking about carbon density in units of kilograms carbon per meter squared. And that's standardized to one meter depth. So just where we actually sample the cores. And in Pacific Northwest dunes average across all of our sites and all of our profile locations, uh, we get an average of roughly three kilograms carbon per meter squared. So now we can finally answer my first question, um, which is sort of comparing the carbon storage capacity of Pacific Northwest dunes with dunes from other regions of the world and other ecosystems. And um, all these numbers here are in kilograms carbon per meter squared. And um, this first column is showing my measurements, um, sort of a range for the above ground biomass carbon densities, but also sort of the below ground biomass and the sand combined. And what we see is relative to other coastal dunes in the second column, um, uh, our, our measurements fall um, kind of right in the middle of the range that we see at other systems. Um, but one thing to point out is that the upper bounds of other dunes, um, there's just one study in the United Kingdom that had higher estimates of carbon density than the measurements that I made. All of the other estimates of dune carbon storage were quite a bit lower than, than our measurements. So, so really we're sort of higher carbon densities here than most places with the exception of one in the United Kingdom. Compared to salt marshes, um, the Pacific Northwest students actually have a little bit higher above ground biomass carbon storage, um, 0.37 to 0.1, um, but uh, quite a bit less below ground, where the highest values we recorded are just under four, and the minimum values in salt marshes are over four. And as we continue to look at other types of coastal ecosystems, we see that difference um, increase, where eelgrass meadows, um, you can see the upper bounds of both above ground and below ground carbon density start to become an order of magnitude higher than any of the carbon density measurements that I took in coastal dunes. And when we look at tropical mangroves, um, it becomes even more exaggerated. Um, and so to sort of summarize this table, um, we see that Pacific Northwest coastal dunes uh, generally store more carbon than other coastal dune systems, but quite a bit less carbon than salt marshes, eelgrass beds, and mangroves. And there's a couple of explanations for this. Um, one is just the differences in vegetation, especially as we look at tropical mangroves. These are essentially forests that are growing in shallow ocean waters. And so there's a lot of woody tree biomass compared to sort of the grass vegetation that I looked at in the study. There's way more biomass, and that woody biomass is also more carbon dense than the soft herbaceous plant tissues of grasses. Um, so that's one big explanation uh, that could be contributing to these differences. But another component is differences in the size of the sediment itself. So if any of you have taken a soil science class, um, there are three like, sort of main sizes of the soil. We have sand, silt, and clay. And sand are the largest particles that have large pore spaces. And they're not as well, um, they're not as able to like hold on to organic matter um, as opposed to silts and clay, which are much smaller. And they're the primary size of sediment in these other coastal ecosystems. They're able to sort of hold more organic matter. And like I mentioned earlier, these other three systems uh, are at least partially or completely submerged in water, whereas dunes are always sort of sitting high and dry. And so that difference in moisture could also be uh, influencing sort of uh, how long that carbon stays in that system or how quickly it gets um, decomposed and broken down. So first question answered. Um, the second question is looking at carbon density and how it varies by site, profile location, and stock type. And so this plot is showing a few things. Um, again, we're looking at all the sites organized north and south, left to right. Um, I've added these sort of background shading just to help break up like, what site you're looking at. Um, on the bottom, we're looking at the toe, crest, heel, and back within each site. And again, this is carbon density in kilograms carbon per meter squared, standardized to one meter depth. And there's a few things to note from this plot. First is that 
the carbon in the above ground biomass, so this, this green portion of the bar, is much, much less than the amount of carbon you see below ground in the roots and rhizomes. And it's, it's really that giant dense field of grass is just like the tip of the iceberg when it comes to doing carbon. Um, we also see that there's not a ton of variation between sites, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. And generally, carbon increases from the toe to the back within each site. Um, and then finally, um, one thing I wanted to point out that I didn't include driftwood carbon in any of my analyses because we didn't really hit it super often. But where we did find carbon, or where we did find driftwood in our cores, um, it had the potential to really uh, drastically increase the carbon density at those at those locations. And so I just wanted to sort of demonstrate, like some of these places, even ten centimeters of driftwood in a core can double or triple estimates of carbon density. And so now to look at site profile location and stock type sort of broken up. Um, again, this is showing carbon density on the y-axis. This is looking at just the above ground biomass, just the plants you see on the surface. And we did find a significant difference between sites where Silk Goose, Oregon um, in the south, sort of noted with this lowercase b, had significantly higher above ground carbon densities than Graydon Harbor or Long Beach, Washington, and also higher than Umpah Dunes, Oregon. And I think the reason for this is that the, the overall shoot density of the grasses is just a lot higher at Silk Goose. Um, there's nothing that's respectful about the grasses there. There's just more of that grass per unit area. For the below ground biomass carbon density, so this is the roots and rhizomes, um, we didn't find any significant differences between sites. Um, it's pretty consistent across the board. Again, we generally see an increase from the toe of the dune to the back within each site, um, but no difference between sites. And then for sand carbon density, um, this is where we saw sort of the most stark differences, where the three more than most sites. Grayland Harbor, Long Beach, and Plattsville Plains uh, had significantly higher sand carbon density than at least some of the sites south of there. I haven't shown all the pairwise comparisons here because it gets kind of messy, um, but these three did have higher sand carbon density than many of the southern sites, and that could be due to a couple explanations. The first is that those three northernmost sites are the only sites that are dominated by Amophila brevilligulata, um, whereas the rest of the sites south of there are dominated by Amophila arenaria. Um, however, that doesn't seem to make a ton of sense or explain this pattern here because we don't see that those three more than most sites actually have more carbon in the above ground or below ground biomass. So it's not clear that Amophila brevilligulata is, is, is really the main driver of this difference in sand carbon density. Um, one other explanation is that these three northern sites are right near the outlets of Willow Bay in Washington and the Columbia River, which both discharge a lot of sediment every year that is very nutrient rich. And longshore currents along the Pacific coast are distributing that sediment um, along the beaches immediately north and south uh, of those outlets. And so it could just be um, that there is more carbon in the sediment that's getting delivered to those locations compared to the sites south of there. So again, this is some speculation, um, but that could be driving the pattern we see in sand carbon density. Uh, moving on to profile location and carbon stock type. Um, along the top here, we're looking at each profile location. So we've now averaged all these values across sites, and we're just trying to compare how much carbon is in each stock type across the dune profile. Um, and again, the, the y-axis has stayed the same. It's carbon density in kilograms, carbon per meter squared. So what we see is that at the toe of the core dune, um, we have significantly less carbon in the above ground biomass than we have at the crest helium back, which is shown by a single asterisk versus two asterisks. Um, and so it's interesting that we have a significant increase from the total crest, but then the above ground biomass carbon sort of levels off and doesn't continue to increase. If we look at the below ground biomass carbon, we see sort of a similar pattern where there's definitely significantly more carbon in the below ground biomass than in the above ground at each profile location. Um, but we see a similar pattern where it increases significantly from the toe to the crest, but then from the crest onwards, it doesn't increase a whole lot more. So you have two asterisks indicating no significant difference beyond the crest. However, when we look at the sand carbon density in these yellow bars, um, we see that not only does it have significantly higher carbon density than the above ground biomass at every profile location, it also increases significantly from toe to crest to heel to back. So one star, two stars, three stars, four. And um, we think the reason for this uh, pattern of carbon density has to do with sort of ecological succession stages across the four dune profile, where at the toe of the dune, the vegetation is very newly established. It's not very dense yet. Um, and so we do have some carbon there, um, but once we get to the crest of the dune, uh, that vegetation is like sort of reached uh, pretty close to its maximum density. And so we have significantly more carbon to the crest. And then at the heel and back, the vegetation isn't getting, um, it's not much more carbon in the vegetation, 
but we're still getting into later successional stages where at the heel and back of the dune, there's been more consecutive years of vegetation growth, more biomass accumulation, more litter decomposition. And so we think at the heel and back, that's how we see continuing higher rates of carbon density at those profile locations. And then the final part of question two was looking at differences in carbon density by dominant grass species. So the four species we looked at were the native grass, and the smallest, the new Amophila hybrid grass, uh, Amophila arenaria, and Amophila brevilibulata. What you'll notice right away is that the Amophila hybrid doesn't have an error bar. So of the close to 200 cores that I took, um, only one was under a patch of this hybrid grass. So there's, there's no error bar for sample size one, but right away we see that it has uh, twice the carbon density of any of these other species, which has, again, a lot of sort of surprising implications for how the spread of this hybrid grass might impact carbon storage in the future. Um, we also see that lamus smallest, the native grass, surprisingly had significantly higher carbon density than either of the Amophilus species, which is very surprising because, again, these dunes were built by the Amophilus species and sort of wouldn't look like this without the density of these invasive species. And sort of two potential explanations for this are that the native grass lamus moss is actually just a bigger plant. Um, so each individual shoot is much larger, it has more mass than an individual shoot of either an alpha species. Um, but also contributing to this pattern could just be um, that lamus mollusk, the native grass, tends to grow in higher densities at the heel and back of the organ. Um, so at these later succession stages. So this plot is showing again all of our sites north to south. Um, these three northern sites are the only ones where Amalfa brevilegulata are dominant, and Lamus mollus, um, the native grass in blue, really occurs mostly at the heel and back. So it might not be that Lamus mollus is inherently better at, at sequestering and storing carbon, but just happens to grow in higher densities at these later um, successional stages. So to conclude and wrap up question two, how does carbon storage vary by depth, forward and profile location, carbon stock type, and site and dominant grass species? We found the carbon density decreases with depth. The above ground and below ground carbon densities increase from the toe to the crest, but then sort of level off, whereas the sand carbon density increases at each profile location. The above ground biomass carbon density is lower than the below ground and sand carbon densities at every profile location. So there's way more below ground than above ground. And we found that the above ground biomass carbon is highest at Silicus, Oregon, whereas the sand carbon densities are highest at our northern sites. The native grass has higher carbon density than either of the Amophila species, but the asterisk that it could just be due to differences in where it grows. Um, and then the hybrid Amophila has higher carbon density than any other species, again, with an asterisk of sample size one. So that wraps up question two. And I know those first two questions took a long time to get through. Um, so to give you all a break, question three is only one slide. Um, so in order to try to figure out what all the um, sort of physical and ecological factors are that can contribute to variation in carbon storage. We're in a bunch of linear multiple regression models, um, including things like beach width, beach slope, uh, dune height, dune width, the density of grasses that grow, so all the things I talked about in those metric slides. And the only thing that really consistently came out as significant and explained a sizable portion of the variation uh, was sediment deposition rate. So how much has that location where we took our cores accreted or eroded? And um, when broken up by profile location, it explains 51% of the variation in carbon density, which is pretty good for ecology. Um, and what's really interesting here is that at the toe of the dune, deposition rate and carbon density have a positive correlation, but at the crest heel and back, they have a negative correlation. So Sally mentioned earlier that my former lab named Papa Jay did a really similar survey of carbon in the dunes in North Carolina. And in her study, she found a negative correlation sort of across the board. And what we think is happening here is that if you remember um, earlier on when I showed the carbon density along the beach and along the dune, we actually saw higher carbon densities in the sand at the beach than at the toe of the dune. And so it could be that at the toe of the dune, where there's not a ton of carbon coming from the vegetation, where there's more sediment deposition, that relatively carbon rich sediment could be piling up at the toe of the dune and increasing the carbon densities at that location. Whereas the crest came back, where there's a lot more carbon from presumably the vegetation, the sand that gets added there tends to actually dilute the carbon in those locations. Um, so again, it's sort of why we think we're seeing um, this pattern. Uh, to summarize that, um, where vegetation is sparse at the toe, shown on the left here, 
Um, we see that sediment deposition could subsidize dune carbon, but where vegetation is dense at later successional stages, it could be diluting dune carbon. And uh, finally, moving on to question four is the last one. Um, we're trying to understand how do HRAs impact dune carbon storage. And in order to understand that, I first want to talk a little bit about the differences in the type and duration of management at each of these three restoration areas. So at Ledbetter Point, Washington, which is in the north, um, sort of have these pictures of the back to the beach looking out at the dune. And um, what you see right away is that the reference area uh, doesn't look a whole lot different in the restoration area, um, where in the back sort of here, you can see a lot more bare sand compared to this area. But there's a, a, a new four dune that's established in front of the restoration treatment zone in the last 10 years or so um, that is covered with Mothla brevilligulata. So this sort of new dune has been um, excluded from the treatment area. It looks very similar to the reference area. And so the main differences we see are sort of in this back profile location. I'll also note that the, the restoration area, um, it's hundreds of meters further landward before you transition to coastal forest. Um, where that transition to forest happens much closer to the shoreline in the reference area, and that'll come up um, in the next slide. At Nihilum, Oregon, so this is in northern Oregon, um, if you kind of see in a single picture where the reference area is versus where the HRA is, so this reference area is uh, a higher, larger dune that's covered in really dense amapla, whereas the restoration area, which was established in 2019, um, has been graded to a lower elevation and has a lot of the amapla grass removed. Um, this is the newest restoration area. Um, and so one thing that's kind of hard to see in this picture is that while there is a, a large reduction in the above ground biomass, um, a lot of the amalfa that got moved and bulldozed has kind of been tilled into the upper meter of sand. And so it's sort of hard to see here, but that will also become apparent in the next slides when we look at some of the data. And then at Dunes Overlook, Oregon, um, this is in Southern Oregon. Uh, again, you can sort of see the reference area looking along the coastline. Um, it's a much taller dune, dense amalfa area and area. Whereas the HRA, which has been established for over a decade at this point, um, has really thorough amophila removal, and there's almost no living amophila at that um, restoration area. So kind of knowing a little bit about types of treatment here will help us understand the differences we see um, in the data. So looking just at that better point, um, again, that, that new forging has formed in front of the restoration area. It's got amophila on it already, and so we don't see very big differences in carbon density, except for in the below ground biomass. Um, where we have sort of two stars here and one star here. And um, that's really driven by the lack of amophila in that back forming profile location where the treatment is still being applied quite regularly. At Nihilum Bay, where this treatment is relatively new, um, we sort of didn't see uh, any significant differences between carbon density from the above ground biomass, below ground biomass, or in the sand. Um, there was sort of a, a reduction in the carbon density of the above ground biomass, but not significantly so. Um, and again, I, I sort of, I suspect that's because a lot of the amount of vegetation that was relatively recently removed is sort of still in the process of breaking down in that upper meter of dune where we took our cores. And then finally at Dunes Overlook um, in Southern Oregon, where the treatment has been most comprehensive, uh, we see a significant reduction in carbon density with the above ground biomass, the below ground biomass, and sand. Um, and, and again, I think this is just because of the, the really thorough removal of all that mothra over um, the past decade plus. And again, if you want to sort of compare carbon stocks, you have to know the carbon density and the volume of dunes. So looking at how the actual shape of the dunes at this restoration area has changed, um, you can see that at a point, um, the restoration area actually has significantly larger dune volumes per meter of coastline. It's not necessarily uh, because of any difference in sort of the shape of the four dune. It's just that uh, the grassy dune area extends hundreds of meters further before it transitions to forest. So it's not necessarily that it's a bigger dune, it's just a lighter dune system. Um, at the Nihilum HRA, uh, this symbol is uh, kind of uh, noting a p value less than 0 0.1, so maybe a slightly significant difference um, where the HRA um, does have a reduction in dune volume relative to the reference site. And at Dunes Overlook, um, we didn't see a reduction in volume here. Um, I suspect that the reason for this is that the, the dunes at the, rep, the restoration area, sorry, um, they are a lot lower in elevation, but they also are wider um, in the cross direction. So they might be canceling each other out to yield a fairly similar dune volume. Now, if we kind of multiply these things together with the carbon density by the volume of sand there, um, we're comparing the carbon stock between 
each restoration area and its reference site. And so at Ledbetter Point in the top meter of dunes, um, there's, there's more carbon per meter of coastline um, in the restoration area. But again, this is mostly an artifact of just how wide the dune is there. It actually had a little bit lower carbon density and the low ground biomass. There's just so much extra sand that kind of is, is um, outcompensated. And we see the same thing for the total in volume. Um, again, this is tons of carbon per meter of coastline. At Medium Bay, uh, in the top meter of dune, where our cores actually went, um, we see that there's no significant difference or no reduction in carbon uh, at the HRA. Um, but if we look at the total dune volume, we do see um, not a significant difference, but, but uh, a sizable reduction in carbon stock in the total volume of dune. Um, again, I think that's not driven by any difference in the carbon density because they didn't really measure a difference in carbon density. But the, the habitat restoration area was graded to a much lower volume, so there's just less sand there, less carbon um, in, that, in that sand. And then finally, um, at the dunes overlook restoration area, um, because we did see such a dramatic difference in the carbon density between the reference site and the restoration area, we do see significant reduction in carbon stock per meter of coastline, both in the top meter of dune and in the total volume of dunes. Um, so sort of the take home here is that the impact of restoration areas on carbon storage really depends on sort of how thorough um, these different restoration treatments are. Um, the last thing I want to kind of talk about with these restoration areas is something really interesting is that we found a lot more driftwood in the cores at restoration areas than we did at each of their reference sites. So more at the HRA than the reference, more at the HRA than the reference, and way more at the overlook than the reference. And, you know, it could be that it just happens to be more driftwood at these sites, but I think a more likely explanation is that this driftwood has been there for a long time um, and it's sort of washed up on the beach um, in, and it contributed to the process of dune formation. So there could be driftwood buried in the dune already, but at the reference sites, our cores aren't really deep enough to actually hit that driftwood. Um, and so we take a core and most of the time we don't hit it. However, at the HRAs, a bulldozer comes through and reduce the dune to a lower elevation, and suddenly that driftwood is a lot closer to the surface. So when we take our cores, it actually goes through the driftwood. And so that might be explaining why we see so much more driftwood in the HRA cores versus the reference cores. Um, and just to give you a sense of how much driftwood is there and the size of some of these logs, um, these are across several different sites, uh, mostly in Southern Oregon, where you can see these massive uh, you know, driftwood logs that are you know, two, three, four feet around. Um, this is a, an eroded dune, sort of looking at the dune from the beach, and there's driftwood just sticking straight out of there. And so, they're, you know, doing more comprehensive surveys of driftwood and dunes would, would allow us to have more informed um, estimates of how much they're contributing to the environment. Uh, to sort of summarize the conclusions of my fourth question by site, at Ledbetter Point, the HRA treatments are only maintained at the, at the forward and back, which is very wide. And so we happen to see um, a little bit lower below the biomass carbon density, but the overall carbon stocks are higher in the restoration area. At New Haven Bay, the HRA treatment is relatively new since 2019. Um, and so we see slightly lower above ground biomass carbon density um, and much lower dune volumes. And that dune volume contributes to lower carbon stocks in the restoration area compared to the reference area. And then at Dunes Overlook, um, the HRA treatment is much more comprehensive. So we see lower carbon densities that lead to much lower carbon stocks at the reference, um, at the restoration area. And again, this is a picture of some of the driftwood that we see um, close to the surface at those HRAs. So that concludes um, the questions of my thesis and thinking about sort of carbon storage in the future and, and um, directions for future research. Um, I think it would be really, really cool to look at carbon storage and do it from other regions of the world. Again, there's whole continents for which you have no estimates of carbon storage in dunes. Um, it'd be really good to look at carbon deeper than one meter. And um, so we're sort of not just making these assumptions about what density is deeper than that without knowing with some certainty. Um, it would be really great to have more comprehensive surveying of the distribution of driftwood in dunes um, to understand what sort of contribution they're making to carbon storage in these systems. Um, it'd be great to look at sequestration rates between dominant grass species, um, particularly in the context of climate change. So if warmer weather or change in precipitation um, could lead to different competitive outcomes between the species, it could change the range and distribution of those species. And again, we know that these species do have differences in um, carbon density. Um, 
And so all of those things could be influenced by future climate change. Um, climate change could also influence June carbon storage through uh, physical um, processes like sea level rise and increased erosion. So in the Pacific Northwest, um, climate change is causing uh, larger um, winter waves um, and uh, have higher runup on the beach and erode more of the dunes. So all of the carbon that's in these dunes could be lost during um, these larger erosion events. And these are pictures of the Oregon coast, uh, where after keen tides and sort of large storms, we see uh, erosion of over 10 feet um, by and sort of wrap up. Um, hopefully, I've convinced you all that there is a lot of carbon in Sigmar Crest coastal dunes. It's generally more than dunes from other regions of the world, but quite a bit less than other coastal ecosystems per unit area. Most of that carbon is stored below ground. The carbon density increases with ecological succession across the organ profile. The habitat restoration areas have the potential to reduce dune carbon storage, but it really does depend on sort of how thorough and comprehensive that treatment is. And driftwood may be a significant source of carbon in coastal dunes. Finally, um, I'd like to make the case for tying back to the beginning, um, carbon storage is one of many ecosystem services that dunes provide. And so I think it should just be included in future management decisions, um, especially with regard to the spread of the multiple hybrid. Um, and as we think about um, future climate scenarios that um, the dunes are likely to experience. That concludes uh, my research talk. Now I'd like to transition now to acknowledgments. And first and foremost, I would like to thank the grasses and dunes. Um, these are just some of the most beautiful places I've ever seen uh, in my life. And I really feel super fortunate and grateful to have seen so many amazing places where I've not only learned a lot about the natural world, but about myself. I'm very grateful for that. And I, of course, wouldn't have had the opportunity to see these amazing places if it weren't for Sally. Um, thank you for bringing me into the lab and for teaching me so much about dunes and natural ecosystems, for giving me the opportunity to see some of these incredible places and to meet some amazing people, including uh, several lifelong friends. I'm important for all your feedback, feedback and input over the years. Um, I wouldn't have got this one today if any of my masters. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank the rest of my committee, um, Dr. Peter Majero, John Greenos, Francis Chan, for all your help over the past few years, um, particularly Peter for providing a lot of input on these projects. Um, Peter is a co-PI on the grant that funded a lot of this work and had a lot of input, taught me more than I thought there ever was to know about the tiny, tiny rocks that we call sand. Um, and he and John have both been very supportive and I appreciate their, their mentorship and encouragement over the past few years. I'd also kind of like to make an honorable mention to Dr. Miguel Goni, who was on the first iteration of my committee and provided a lot of help when I was trying to figure out the best way to measure carbon in these sand samples. I'd like to thank uh, NSF for um, funding me on my fellowship for the last three years and for um, the NOAA grant, the Ecological Effects of Sea Level Rise that has um, funded all the research that I just talked about. I'd also like to thank Oregon State Parks, um, Washington State Parks, the U.S. Forest Service, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for helping me coordinate all the permitting for beach access, research permits, um, getting around all the snow and cover restrictions, helping me find access points to drive onto the beach and all over here. Um, in particular, Will Ritchie, Ben Cox, Cindy Burns, Courtney Gabriel, and Jay Samuel. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Ben Russell, who is the mastermind architect of uh, the sediment extruder, which um, without that thing, we would not have been able to do all this work. Um, so thank you, Ben, for, for helping us design and build that thing. It is quite sturdy, and um, I feel bad for whatever student might uh, pick up that project in the future. <laughs> that thing is. Um, I'd like to thank Jeff Wood, Heidi Ann Welch, Andrew Gerber, Aaron Peck, and the Stats Consulting Labs for all the help in my field work, lab work, and um, sort of my data analysis. They all contributed in various ways to make the process a lot smoother and support um, all my research efforts. Um, in no particular order, I'd like to thank the IB office staff, um, Teresa, Tara, Tracy, Trudy, and Lissa. You all have been incredibly supportive and kind over the past few years, have uh, been so patient with me as I make a huge clustering mess of all the paperwork for travel forms and reimbursements and degree change and everything. I, I really appreciate your patience and support. Um, it, it really made the grad school process feel a lot more manageable, um, having someone to kind of like lay it out for me. Um, so thank you very much. I'd also like to thank um, the rest of the Eastler research group. So in addition to Sally and Peter, um, Steve Dundas, I'm in Beardsep, and Mosin Tarakani, um, who all helped me think about dunes from multiple different perspectives and think about the other ecosystem services they provide. And um, speaking of most, I'd like to thank the rest of Peter's lab, the Near Shore All-Stars and friends, Paige Vanga, Meredith Plum, Rebecca Edgel, and Lawrence, all sort of helped me understand how dunes work in the early days of grad school. As I said, I used to study reptiles, so I had no idea what I was doing. 
Um, so I appreciate all their in the field and MATLAB code, et cetera. Um, also, Megan Nungo, student Jeff Dickey, and Craig Greener. Um, I also like to thank them for challenging me to think of an even cooler nickname for our lab here, the New York All Stars. <laughs> <laughs> right back for all of us. Um, where we actually made a t shirt of uh, a toilet we found in the news of Boston. Um, I'd like to thank all the nice grads, um, including uh, especially my cohort, Brian, Courtney, Cameron, Ricardo, Jesse. Christy and Emily, y'all have been extremely supportive and a lot of fun and made the grad school journey a lot more enjoyable. Um, and I appreciate all of your support along the way. I'd like to thank all the field techs that helped me. Um, some of you are here today in the audience or on Zoom. Um, Chloe Hull, Cecilia Urban, Rose Ontaki, Dakota Fee, Hugh Lee, Fabian Mata, uh, Claire McDonald, and Max Fry. Um, all of them helped with various forms of field work or lab work, and I could not have done this without them. Um, I'd also like to thank, in particular, Cecilia, Rose, Dakota, and Hugh, who were sort of my, my early COVID friend group um, when I was not allowed to hang out with people besides Gilbert. And you just made the process a blast and um, really helped me get through that first year of the pandemic. So thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank my lab mates, um, both past and current uh, Ruben Beal, Vanessa Constant, Caitlin Model, Kathy J. Rebecca Mostow, Zachary Nelia, Risa Askruth, and Danielle Whalen. Um, you all have helped in a number of ways with projects, and I'm an incredible friend. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to thank our union, the Coalition of Graduate Employees, who um, showed me more solidarity and the power of collectivism than I think was possible. And um, I feel so proud of the accomplishments we made um, as a union. Um, the institution of academia is embedded with a lot of structures that sort of require exploitation of labor, both for faculty, instructors, postdocs, and especially grad students who currently made lower than the cost of living in Fort Dallas. And I cannot thank this group of people enough for all their efforts and all the solidarity. <laughs> On the fun stuff, um, I'd like to take a Corvallis Sports Park and my martial arts gym. Um, I've always wanted to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and uh, this were by far my most healthy and important outlets in grad school um, to kind of get rid of stress and help process all the difficult parts. Um, I'd like to thank all of my friends who reminded me to get outside, to have fun, reminded me that, um, that uh, I'm sort of, <laughs> I'm allowed to have fun and then not just be working all the time. So I appreciate all of you reminding me of that. I would like to thank my family. Um, my mom's here today, and a lot of you are watching it soon. And um, yeah, I'm just very grateful for all this work over the years. Um, I couldn't have done it without you. And finally, uh, <laughs> it gets harder every slide. <laughs> um, can a man cry? Um, I'd like to thank Aiden and Rue for being. Just the best partners I could ask for. Um, I love our little pack and I appreciate all the support that you provided along the way. And I'd like to thank Brew, especially for being uh, my field work buddy who we went out on a few of my field work experiments to help me measure the profile of the dudes. And uh, she was such a big help. Um, and so I'm grateful for all the things. And um, yeah, I uh, will uh, take any questions now that you have. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, okay, so for person like me who works in like arid dune systems trapping small mammals. I don't think about carbon sequestration in those dunes at all, but for an expert like yourself, what would you hypothesize to be, you know, the relative difference in carbon storage in like desert dunes that are dominated by vegetation, but much more shrubby vegetation, things like atroplex and um, sarcobatus and um, say yeah, that's that's a great question. Sort of thinking about what's the carbon storage potential of sort of interior dunes that are not necessarily coastal and having more you know, shrubby habitat. Um, again, I think vegetation is sort of the primary control of dune carbon storage. Um, and so, uh, sort of 
I'm not familiar with, with all of these systems, but depending on sort of the root depth, you know, in some desert systems, the plants do have, you know, like there are some plants that go meters down to reach the water table. Um, so I, I'm thinking sort of vegetation is the primary control um, in deserts that have sort of uh, a lot like smaller vegetation, more like sort of um, biomats. Um, there, I, I saw a few sort of studies that have looked at biological soil crusts in the carbon in, in just those top few centimeters. And so um, I think, you know, it's probably going to be if there's less vegetation, probably less carbon. Um, that it could be that with deep roots, um, you know, there's there's more deeper down, um, or if the, the actual type of sediment itself, you know, there's a lot of volume of sediment there, and so if there is carbon in that sand, and there's a lot of sand that can still add up to. to but I'd imagine it's probably less because I don't know of any engineered dunes that look like this. Yeah, very different. Cool, thanks. Um, you know that the hybrid between the two and the species is like much more, uh, it's better at storing carbon, better at trapping sand. Um, can you speak to like maybe why that is? And also, do you see any variation within individual species, like between population sites, like maybe some kind of like population level structure within different species that might be contributing to those differences? Um, yeah, I'm just trying to go back to that slide. It should take a while. Um, so the the difference in species. So make sure I understand all the components of your question. Um, the Amalfa hybrid. So Marisa or maybe even Rebecca could answer this better. Um, but so there are there are, are patches across the the, the northwest coast. Um, it was only a sort of a dominant patch on, on one of our actual cores. And this particular patch, um, if you remember in Reese's presentation, this is the one like back crossed individual um, and Pacific City, Oregon, um, where the, the stem density was like over a thousand stems per meter squared. And like for reference, the highest um, or shoot density, I should say, the highest shoot density for any of these other species is like maybe you'll see three or four hundred um, grass shoots per meter squared. And this, this particular patch, like you just saw it as soon as you walked up the dune, it just looked like this like clownishly large grass, um, like this huge clump. Um, and so I, I, I don't even know that this particular patch is characteristic of all the hybrid out there because this is, again, a back cross individual, whereas I think most of the other hybrids are um, F1 or F2. I understood Rebecca and Reese's research correctly. So I think that's sort of one big difference. Um, and can you remind me of the other component of the question? Yeah, it might be kind of outside the scope of what you looked at, but did you see any variation like within the apocalypse or maybe a lot of sites like Earth like that, for example? Like, are there variations in like the amount of defense that are like able to catch sand and build dunes? I see. Um, within the population, I, I guess I wouldn't know, if, you know how much variation there is in like the traits that are important for dune building. Um, so I'd be like the height and the density of those grasses. I, I don't know what the variation is in those populations. Um, but a part of the important part of it is along the dune profile, the toe has more sediment deposition than the crest, and the crest has more than the heel in the back. So basically, as the dune forms, the high point of the crest sort of starts to block everything behind it and receding sand gets blown up the beach. And so um, it's it's there's probably some variation within the population of its sand capture uh, traits. Um, but it's also important of where those grasses are growing. The ones in the back that do just aren't going to trap as much sand because the sand never reaches it. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions or questions on Zoom? Uh -huh. <clears throat> Question It says, how do you think dune grass type, dune high, affects onshore, offshore sediment transport, and most importantly, wave quality? How does the dune grass influence? Onshore and offshore sediment transport, and can you say the wave type? Wave quality. Wave quality. Uh, <laughs> my dad asks this question. Um, I, uh, you know, I don't know how much the, the grasses in the are going to impact some of those larger scale physical processes. Um, there are feedbacks between um, sort of the wave environment and the size of the grains and the sort of the, the slope of the beach that influence. How high the dune can get and how far from the waterline it will establish. Um, but I can't say that I know an uh, impact the grass will have on the wave environment. I think it's going to be driven by much larger um, climate and ocean graphic processes. But maybe Peter will correct me if you go into our small meeting. <laughs>
One more. <laughs> What's next? Uh, retired. <laughs> uh, I, I moved up to Washington and I'm um, looking for jobs still up there and I'm looking forward to playing a lot of soccer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.